Okay, what about now? It is. Okay, tonight we are studying in 2 Kings chapter 23, uh, 21 through 23, and also 2 Chronicles chapter 33 through 35. We'll be talking about Manasseh, Ammon, and Josiah, three of the kings that, uh, that we'll be talking about tonight. Uh, it seems that they don't give you enough information. You're always wanting more every time you, you know, you read some of these things and you wish you knew the answers. And sometimes it gives you just tremendous amount of information. And, uh, we're going to kind of go over that tonight, but not in great detail of all the things that were destroyed and stuff. There's just numbers of verses that talk about things that were destroyed and things like that. So, but, uh, we will begin, uh, with Manasseh. Manasseh becomes king of Judah, and as we know, what has happened to the northern kingdom right now? Carried away into captivity. Carried away into captivity, yes. And so uh, Judah, the northern, the southern kingdom, is the only one that's left of the two. And God has uh, seen to it that Israel was taken away, and as Chris said uh, last time, when Hezekiah, I mean, I'm sorry, when they were taken away, they took all the people of any kind of wealth and anything, took them out, left the poor and the, and all the ones that could not do much for themselves, left them there and brought in people from, uh, Assyria and, uh, put them there. So that's kind of the situation that we're looking at right now. He is the son of Hezekiah. What kind of king was Hezekiah? Everybody remembers what kind of king Hezekiah was. He's a good king, wasn't he? Very good king. And, um, he, he is one of, the, one of the best we've read about, I think, so far. So we would expect Manasseh would at least come in and do something like his father. Uh, he became king at 12 years old, which I can't imagine a 12-year-old, and later Josiah, an 8-year-old. I can't, I can't imagine being king. And I know they had advisors, but um, that you have to grow up pretty quickly being that way. Uh, he was the longest reigning king in 50, he reigned 55 years. And so being the wicked king is told that he's a wicked king and he reigns 55 years. Well, how is Manasseh different from all the previous kings? There's a few ways, a few, few things. Right. Okay, yeah, that was exactly what I was thinking. I don't know, I don't remember any other king that started out wicked and ended up faithful. Am I missing it or is, you know, it's, you start thinking back over me and you think, well, I don't know, but I don't remember that. And so he was, um, he, he went from wicked to, it seems to me like a, a very, you know, as good a king as a lot of the other ones were. Uh, he was better than a lot, better than some and equal to a lot of the others. Um, now, you remember Hezekiah in the last 15 years, uh, Hezekiah became sick. And what happened whenever he became sick and, and thought he was going to, was told he was going to die? Pleaded the Lord, the Lord gave him 15 more years. Lord gave him 15 more years. Okay. So we see that Manasseh here is 12 years old. See, Hezekiah only lived to be 53 to 54 years old. If I, I, I've just kind of looked and said, they, they think it's like 51 to 54 years old. So there's a possibility from what I've read that Manasseh and Hezekiah, Hezekiah could have been co-regent. They could have both been kings at the same time. It's not told that. It's just some historian, some think they were, some think they weren't. So let's say they weren't co-regents. Let's say they weren't reigning together at the same time. That would make uh, Manasseh being born at how long after Hezekiah is told he's going to die? Three years. three years. Okay. So he at least would have three years with Hezekiah. And from what I've read, I can't find anywhere where Hezekiah had any other sons. So he's the one that's going to be in line for the king, you know, to be the king. And surely Hezekiah didn't just leave him alone and say, okay, they're about to make you king, I'm about to die. And so surely he saw the things that Hezekiah did, uh, you know, the things that he tore down, the things, the way everything was being run and his righteousness. But Manasseh is just rebellious. He just, he just purposely does 
what's wrong, and he, he doesn't care. He just seems like he wants to show that he's king and he can do anything he wants. So he was, like I said, he was different in that he, he started out wicked, and it doesn't tell when in here he started. He, he turned and did what was right. 55 years, he could have been after 10 years, could have been after 45 years. Who knows? So uh, we, just, we just don't know that. If Hezekiah only had him as son, only had Manasseh as a son, and it's, it's suggested that it probably that's the case because if there were any other sons, they would have been older than Manasseh, and they would have probably been the ones picked to be the king. So um, he only has one son, and if that's the case, we're down to one again. We're down to one left, and if anything happens to him, there's no other in the, in the line of David that can follow after that. So you see how many times, and that, this is, like I said, this is kind of speculative, but it seems to be right that they, they got down to this close again to being down to none. If that's the case, and Hezekiah was co-regent with uh, Manasseh, it could be that Manasseh uh, or Hezekiah does not uh, try to go against uh, uh, Manasseh because if there was a war and Hezekiah is killed, I mean, uh, Manasseh is killed, there's no sons left. So, again, that's just conjecture on my part. Of course, we know that Manasseh was wicked. He rebelled against his righteous father. He had a good upbringing. And, he, and we see that today. We see people, I've seen people that are, and I'm sure you have too, that had the, the, the strongest, most faithful parents, and their, their child just went off and did just rebellious and just went out off the deep end. And you don't understand why. It is hard to know that. Uh, but he rebuilt the high places. All the things that Hezekiah tore down, it's almost like I'm going to build them right back. So he rebuilds the high places. He raises up Baal off altars where they can offer sacrifices to Baal. He makes wooden images. Uh, and he, he worshiped and served all the heavenly hosts. By now, coming through up through the Canaanites and all that they've left, you know, they're, they're always jumped back to Egyptian gods and, and things of that nature. And so all these heavenly hosts, he, he came up with a way to worship every one of them. He made that, he made that available to them because I think that anytime you have some, you know, different people, they all have different interests, different things that tempt them. So if you do them all and you get them all to worship these heavenly hosts, then they're all happy and they're all happy with you as king. And that's what you want is someone to be happy with you as king. He built altars to these hosts so they could offer sacrifices just like they did to God. He caused his sons to pass through the fire. What does it mean to pass through the fire? I offered them as sacrifices. I don't, I don't know that I've ever heard anything argue any different than, you know, just like passing through the fire or something like that, but they, they didn't do, you know, you can rub your, run your finger through the fire. But as far as I've ever heard, everybody has said passing through the fire means that they offer them as sacrifices. So I believe that's correct. I never have really doubted that, but it just seems like they never say they offered them as sacrifices. He engaged in soothsaying, in witchcraft, in sorcery, anything that had to do with mediums or spirits or anything like that, uh, and they weren't supposed to do that too. So uh, he, just, he just had a plethora of all the different sins that they could do, and if he could find more, he would come up with more. He placed an image of Asherah in the temple. And uh, we'll be looking at 2 Kings 21, verse 7 in a minute. Um, you might turn it and look at that. I might ask somebody to read that. This Asherah was a Canaanite goddess. It was a pagan goddess. And it was a goddess of fertility and of enrichment and power. So we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Well, somebody mind, read, mind reading 2 Kings uh, 21 in verse 7. And the carved image of the Shira that he made for uh, that he had made, he said in the house of which the Lord said to David to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem which I have chosen of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. Okay. God said he'll put his name there forever. Manasseh said, I'm going to take your name out. 
I'm going to put this Asherah in there. Uh, I'm going to take and put my own things in there, and your name's not going to be in there anymore. It's, it's almost like he did it for spite. I don't know if it's spite to his father, spite to God. He just, he was just, sounds like he just did it for spite. Um, and then God's promise to fulfill that. If someone would read verse 8, please. God's promise to him if he was faithful, what, he, what God would do for him. Okay, um, why does anybody think that he said, I won't cause their feet to wander? What does he mean by that? Their home. Their home. Whose feet has just wandered not too long before? Who? The feet of the northern kingdom, right? They've walked off. And I think that's what he's talking about. They're not going to make them take off. Maybe I'm, talking, maybe I'm wrong about that. Uh, I just figured he's talking about, I won't take them off anywhere. And that was not, that was not the plan. God did not have a plan. We'll know that, you know, the southern, southern kingdom is going to be taken off and brought back. But God said, if you're faithful to me, I won't cause that to happen. And if I'm wrong, somebody correct me. Um, okay. So God told him if he's faithful, uh, it didn't affect him at all. Manasseh knowingly rebelled against God. If we look at 2 Kings chapter 21, 9 through 11, it talks about how that he, um, he has talked to him. It says in, um, it says in verse 9, but they paid no attention and Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. And the Lord spoke by his servants, the prophets saying, when God speak to his prophets, it's just not, it's not just for the prophets to know. It's for the prophets to tell others which these prophets would have told Manasseh. And it says, because Manasseh, king of Judah, has done uh, these abominations, he has acted more wickedly than the Amorites who were before him, and he has also made Judah uh, sin with his idols. Um, so we see here that, that he has spoken to him. He's given him an opportunity. He's talked to him by the prophets, which... You know, sometimes that would be hard for someone to accept. Okay, are these prophets making this up? Are they just saying, ah, because you don't, you know, you're doing the evil and, and, and we're coming to you in the name of God. But um, it also says that God speaks to him over in, in uh, second, uh, second Chronicles. It says in verse 10 of 32, it says, And the Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they would not listen. So there is no doubt in anybody's mind that, that Manasseh was, was approached by God. Manasseh seduces Judah in every way possible to make uh, wrong seem right. This Canaanite goddess of wickedness was made, the, its purpose was to glorify sin. And that's all it was for, to glorify the sins that you can create. Now, this is a little speculation on my part, but I think it makes a lot of common sense. Okay, so you have this goddess that you want to glorify, and this goddess, Asherah, or Asherah, I've heard it both ways, so I'm not sure what it is. Um, but this goddess is the queen, is the goddess of fertility. So to please this god, you need to do what? Have children. Okay, in order to have children... You have to have relations with, with uh, women would have to have relations with other men. And I think the men probably came up with this because of the fact that they're more prone to want this. And so they make the women think, okay, here's this Canaanite goddess that says, if you have a bunch of children, you're blessed. You'll please this, this goddess if you uh, have more children. So then what do you do with all the children? Well, then it's time to pass them through the fire. It's time to burn them up. And then you don't have all these children. You don't have all these children that, that unwed mothers can't take care of. Just my, just my guess is, is uh, thinking that's that might be the way they were thinking. But does this happen today? Do people try to make wrong seem right? I think today, in my opinion, we've seen it more than we ever have in my life. I mean, somebody want to give me an example or somebody want to comment on that? I've heard chance on, on TV. What do we want? Dead cops. When do we want them right now? Is that right? No, that's not right. Um, 
from the ocean to the sea is another one. That's supposed to mean wipe out all the is- everybody in Israel. Uh, things like that. We see that the government has basically, you know, put LGBTQ and transgenderism on a pedestal. Um, and so everybody thinks this must be right. It must be okay. And it causes people to side with them. And so it is possible, but it's been being done for a long time. It was done back in Manasseh's time and all these other times with these pagans. And all they did basically was try to make things seem right so that you would do them and enjoy yourself. God's warning to Manasseh. Uh, would somebody like to read First, Second, uh, Second Kings two twelve through sixteen. Second Kings two. Therefore, thus says the Lord the God of Israel: Behold, I am bringing upon Jerusalem and Judah such a disaster that the ears of every one who hears of it will tingle. And I will stretch over Jerusalem the measuring line of Samaria and the plumb line of the house of Ahab. And I will wipe Jerusalem as one wipes a dish wiping it and turning it upside down. And I will forsake the remnant of my heritage and give them into the hand of their enemies. They shall become a prey and a spoil to all their enemies because they have done what is evil in my sight and have provoked me to anger since the day their fathers came out of Egypt, even to this day. Moreover, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another besides the sin that he made it Okay, thank you, Ron. So he warns them that, that their ears are going to tingle at the things that they're going to hear, the calamity that's going to come upon Jerusalem. Um, I don't know why they think it wouldn't. They're not a powerful nation anymore, um, but they just totally ignore God even when times are bad. They will, they will do that. What, what was the measuring? What, what was meant by the measuring line of Samaria? The first, the first one. What was that alluding to? Do you know? To me, uh, just according to what happened to Samaria, mm-hmm. complete destruction. That's going to happen. Okay. All right. And when they pull out measuring lines, what I mean, what is that? And that normally means that, doesn't it? You measure off, and this is the, this part is the one that's going to be kept, and this is the part is going to be the one that's taken or killed or whatever. You remember it's been done uh, different ways, uh, but sometimes they were killed, sometimes they were taken. But it's a measuring line, basically, to almost see how you measure up, and they put you in that. Well, to me, it's a figurative way of measuring. Right, right. God yeah. Punished yeah. Oh, okay. So you think it's the measure by which they're going to do it, not that not not some will stay and some will go. Uh, when, Jeru- when Samaria was taken, it was completely destroyed. It was torn down, mm-hmm. and that's what happened when Jerusalem it completely destroyed and torn down. Okay. What about the plummet of Ahab? What is he talking about when he's talking about the plummet of Ahab? Yeah, that's true. They're going to use the same one for for Jerusalem also. Okay, what happened to Ahab I believe it's already happened. I don't you know, I don't know if I've got the years right on this, but what's already happened to Ahab, Ahab's sons? His line was killed off. So, you know, that's that's pretty plummeting when all your sons are gone, are they not? So uh, I, I think that's what he's talking about. Do you think that's what he's talking about? Yeah, and, and he did because when uh, Judah was captured and, and Jerusalem destroyed, mm-hmm. that was the last of the line of David. Also. Right. Yep, that was, the, that was the last of it. So it could still, still be talking about in the future, I guess, uh, as you were talking about it, because during Jerusalem, that would be the time that, that also could, this could refer to. Is that right? And that may be what you were talking about. I may have misunderstood that. I don't know. But um, anyway, like I say, there's a few things that I wish it would be a little bit more. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, a plumb line is used to it hang down and you see if something is 
Right. Mm -hmm. And Manasseh had gone. Right. Way, yeah. Way off. Yeah. And when you plummet down off of something, it, it means you fall like a like a plummet line, plum plumb line, right? You plummet off of something, and and I, you know, I, I was I was thinking, and I, and I like I said I could be off, but I was thinking the, of the plummet that Ahab took whenever his sons were all killed at once. Uh, that, that's that's a pretty big drop whenever you drop off like that. He lost all that. Okay, Manasseh also shed a lot of innocent blood. I never found where he shed any blood other than uh, the children passing through the fire. Yeah, yeah, I did see that too. Um, glad you brought that up. He and why did he kill Isaiah? It was because. Anybody that opposed him, he killed them. So I think that's why they think that, that Isaiah was killed was because Isaiah would have opposed him. All right. The extent of what he did was he covered Jerusalem completely with innocent blood. Right. Yeah, that's true. I mean, all the children naturally would be innocent blood. And then all those, and, and, and like I say, I, until she said that, I forgot that it says that he, he opposed anybody that, that went against him. So, yeah, all those would have been innocent blood, those that were coming on their behalf to God. So I would guess a lot of the prophets got killed, wouldn't you? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. It was extensive right. to cover the city from yeah. one end to the other mm -hmm. with innocent blood. Yeah. Let that go on. That's true. That. Yeah. That's true. And Manasseh didn't he didn't have a care in the world. He wanted anybody that opposed him out. So it didn't it didn't bother him to kill him. So he, he just wanted everybody else to do, you know, to be happy and do what they want, what he wants, or what they want. So Manasseh's led away with hooks and fetters. Um I see I've seen some pictures of, you know, let off with a hook through the nose, uh, from what I, I I couldn't find anywhere. I thought it said through the nose, and I kept looking through here, and I can't find anywhere where it says the hook went through his nose. But I may have missed it. But it said sometimes they would put them through their lips too. And if that wasn't enough, I mean, they would lead them off with that hook through their nose. And you know how disgraceful, how embarrassing that would be as a king. Usually they'd probably just kill them. But no, they want to make a spectacle out of them. So they carry him off. And, of course, if they killed him and he's the last son in, in line, if he's the last son in line, then that wipes it out. So here we have God, you know, watching over him. He's let out in an embarrassing way. You know, fetters or shackles, they wouldn't be needed if, if you've got hooks and guards standing all around when you're walking off. But they, they just want to make a spectacle of him. Okay, he's afflicted. It doesn't say how he's afflicted, but being in a prison like that, I'm sure it's, it was no fun. He's afflicted, and he decides to do what when it, through that and during that affliction, he's taken off, put in prison of some kind. He's somehow in prison. What did the what did the the Jews always do when they got in trouble like that? Called out to the Lord, which Solomon said, "If you turn back to Jerusalem, call out." Right, all right. And there were so many what times, and it still happens that you know Israel and Judah would get into a into a bad situation, and uh, then they would realize you know they were in captivity, and they'd always call for deliverer, and God would go back, and they kept going through this cycle, and so this basically is the same cycle that that uh, Manasseh has done. He's got gone into wickedness. Everything was going well whenever he picked up with Hezekiah because Hezekiah was righteous to God and, uh, and followed God, and so all things were great. But then they, they start getting, getting lackadaisical and start going back and doing the things they want to do, and it leads them into sin, leads them into captivity, and then they have to call for a deliverer. God listened to him, and he brought him back as king. This, I think, would be almost impossible. I don't think anybody would be taken back and made king. I've never heard anybody being, you know, and there may be some more. I am just may not be thinking. But to be in prison, to be a captured king, and go back and be a king of your own country, your own nation, that would be possibly a threat to you, 
I just don't just don't see that happening. And Manasseh realizes this to some extent because he actually realizes that who he actually realizes who God is. God has told him. Now it's starting to ring true. He's starting to think about it. God has told him, if you don't follow me, I'm going to do these things. Your ears are going to tingle, which I'm sure is tingled the whole way. He got to where he was going with those in his lips or nose or what it was, was tingling also. But it was not in a good way. But he realizes that there's no way I would be back as king again if it wasn't God and if God wasn't behind this. And this caused a big change. So Manasseh reforms. He first upgrades the walls and the guards. Um, it, you know, they were like this before and they didn't have any trouble until, you know, things kept getting worse and worse. And I guess he didn't figure out that walls are not that important. See, this is something I don't understand. But I don't know because, you know, to me, when David was king and they were all following each other, do you think they needed a single wall around their, around where they were? You think they actually even needed a wall with God with them? I don't really think they do. I mean, I think it'd be more safe, but I think God would have protected them without a single wall. But they, that's just what they do. It's just what you do. So uh, he upgrades the walls. He builds another wall kind of around the outside, farther out, so it'll be harder to get to him and all this. And he also puts guards. It's not just guards. He takes the captains, the ones that are most responsible people in the army, and puts them on the wall so they can look and see if anything's coming up. Uh, he removes all of his evil uh, temptations. And he starts in the way of anybody that says, and he was, right, he, he was faithful to God. He was a good king. He was righteous king. And he did all that God said, except he didn't do the same thing all the other ones didn't do. And what was that? High places. Didn't tear down the high places. Okay, that was the next question. <laughs> what is one thing Manasseh did not do? He didn't tear down the high places. Um, one of the things, though, I noticed about the high places, did you notice something about the high places there? It said that, um, let's see, I didn't put the, it's in 3311. Uh, what does it say? Nevertheless, the people did sacrifice still in the high places, yet unto the Right, yeah, yeah, that's it. That's that's what I was thinking. I mean, most of the time when people went to the high places, and the reason they didn't want them is because they went up there and offered to who? No one in particular to what? They used to sacrifice. Sacrifice to idols, right. So they normally go up there to do sacrifice to idols. What better place to go up and not get called if the king doesn't like you? Uh, like you're doing that, if the king's righteous, and go up on top of a high place where nobody can see you and offer to, to uh, idols. And so, but in this case, it seems that, that Manasseh really turned these people around to where even though they were going to the high places, it was kind of a habit for them because they had done it, you know, for centuries, um, except for just in a few, few kings' times. Uh, they would go up there and offer on the high places, places. but it was to God and so it tells me that he did better than some, maybe some of the other ones that was a good king, but it, it but didn't didn't offer to who they were supposed to. Um, I, I don't understand why it always calls out, and they say they're a righteous king or an evil king, and it's just how they start off and not how they end. Uh, you know, we always think about Manasseh as a wicked king, and I don't know how long he was wicked, and he was wicked, but. He turned into a good king. What would be better, to start out bad and end up good or start out good and end up bad? <laughs> it's always start out bad and end up good. It's better to start out good and end up good. But if you want to be right with God, you've got, you've got to finish the race, as Paul said. Okay, would you consider Manasseh to be a good king? Huh? No right answer to that. Anybody want to? Nobody want to comment on that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you would, you would. I mean, those things always would would haunt you. Um, but but I really see um, a big change, a big turnaround in him to where he equaled in his last, the last part of his life, however long that was, that he equaled the other kings that were called righteous kings 
that did everything except remove the high places. I think it's a testament to him that he wasn't so hardened that he wouldn't change. Right, right. That he, that he gave yeah. His, he, he played into God. He treated God. Yeah. To the point where God recognized his heart was yeah. changed and, right. and then blessed him. And it's a true def definition to repentance. Um, he didn't just say, I'm in a bad way, and if I can just get out of here, I'll do better, and go back and halfway do what was right. He meant it, and God God knows the heart. God knows that he, he was repentant, and God let him come back. Um, now, there have been times when others said, we'll follow you, and they, they start off following God, but then they, they drop back and go back into to sin. But... Um, but I would consider him, you know, like I say, a pretty good king in the end, naturally, because of he was like a lot of the other ones that said they were good kings. Okay. Manasseh dies and his son Ammon reigns. His son Ammon is just as bad. As he goes right back to what uh, Manasseh did whenever he started out. And to me, Manasseh would have been the best teacher for him ever. I mean, it reigns 55 years. He had to have a lot of time with Ammon. Uh, he started when he was 12, Manasseh did, so he was 67. So he, you know, Ammon, he might have had Ammon around with him for 20 years. And again, I think, you know, I know if I was king and, I, and my son was going to be king, I would have him there showing him the ropes of doing everything and, and what to do and what not to do. And you'd think Manasseh would say, do not do what I did. Because, you know, I don't ever want to be in prison like I was and afflicted like I was. But you can tell people sometimes to you the blue in the face and they don't listen. So Ammon reigns for two small years. He's a wicked king and he did not humble himself for God. God, there's two places that I can remember right offhand that God appreciates being humble before him. Ahab did the same thing. Wicked Ahab. He humbled himself before God. I believe, I'm pretty sure I'm correct on that. And um, I know it was a, one of the kings, but I think it was him. And so, and God, he relented on what he was going to do in their time. Um, he, the ultimate embarrassment and the ultra, ultimate uh, disgrace in history to be killed by your own servants. Um, he is another one that's evidently was just so bad that his servants even hated him and killed him to, and killed him. And then the people of the land go and kill these conspirators. Um, you remember back in Samuel when they asked for a king, they were given rules and regulations on how to treat a king. I would wonder if maybe that's not one of the rules in there is you don't kill the king. I don't know. I know David, you know, David seemed like he had you know, every reason to want to kill, to, to kill Saul because of what Saul did to him, but he wouldn't do it. And I don't know if that was just in his heart. He was a man after God's own heart. Maybe that was just in his heart. But um, these people did not let someone get away from killing their, their own king. It wasn't probably because they loved their king. It's just something you don't do. Uh, you can't have much of a law. You can't have much of a nation or anything if if you're constantly having kings killed, and that's just not the way you operate. Josiah, we know jo Josiah is what kind of king, good or bad? Very good king, yes. So he becomes king, and we're in Second Chronicles 34. Um, he becomes king at eight years old. Again, eight years old, I don't know how, how you could possibly uh, be a, a good king at that, but then again, you have advisors. So you remember that Manasseh reigns for 55 years. So Josiah, I'm sorry, Manasseh, but so Ammon only reigns two years, but Manasseh reigned so long that it gave Ammon time to be older and have children. And so, um, but you would think that he would have children older than eight years old. Which makes me think this is probably an only child too. I couldn't find where Ammon had more than one child either. And if this is the case, here we are again, back to one. And so, you know, kings would have, to me, would have been known to have many, you know, children, to have many wives and many children. But when you read in here, I can only find one wife. I only find it historians of one wife. 
so they, they weren't prolific in children, and so they got dangerously close. He reigned for 31 years. Didn't reign as long as, uh, as, uh, as, as Manasseh. But jo Josiah's reformation begins. He sees all the wickedness that's happening here. And uh, he sees all the things that he needs to take care of with Ammon. And he's just a young boy, yet he still knows what he needs to do. I don't know if God just put that, put that in his heart. I don't know if he had rel you know, relatives, mom, whatever, that was righteous, that taught them. It, it's, or he had advisors that told him the best thing to do. Um, but he sees the wickedness that's going on. And he is upset with it. At 16, he begins to seek the God of his father, David. So uh, he may have done nothing for the first eight years, just kind of let the advisors run it. But at 16, he begins to do that. That's incredible to me. I think of when I was 16 years old. I mean, I never missed a service to go do something I wanted to do. But I would not that there wasn't times that I wanted to. Um, you know, 16 years old, your time of your life, I don't know how these 16 year olds live, but I know we had, you know, you got a car, got a driver's license, get to go places, get to go do things. And it's a wonderful time in your life. And, and to start seeking God at that age, uh, it, to me is, is pretty, is pretty incredible. Said he was, did, he did what was right. He didn't turn to the right or to the left. And if one thing you don't, if it's one thing you take away from this tonight, and that was, is Josiah was, he was incredibly thorough. He did everything to the best of his ability to follow what God did. And that's a wonderful example to us to, to do everything that you can to follow God. He destroyed every single idol he could find. It wasn't, okay, there's a bunch of idols in there going to clear them out. He would, it seems, by looking at the text, it seems he would actually go and look at the you know, look at and see whether they did take care of all the idols or the altars or whatever. He seemed to be physically checking to make sure they didn't miss a single one. Uh, he is thorough in grinding any wood wood uh, idols that they had. They would take them and burn them, and then he would take the ashes and make sure that they were just ground down to powder. Um for I can tell, every utensil that was maybe put in the temple or any other place, they ground it down. I mean, they took the time to grind every bit of it down so you couldn't even see what that was, an eye of an idol or a finger of an idol. They ground it completely to powder. That, that would take a lot of time. Now, of course, Josiah wasn't doing it himself. He had other people doing it. But it was very painstaking what he did. He scatters ashes on the graves of those who worship them. As a disgrace to them, he takes those ashes from those adulterous, adulterous uh, altars and, and things like that. And he takes them and he scatters them to make a to help everyone remember when they see those ashes sitting on those graves uh, that that's what we think. That's what I think about you, and that's what God thinks about you. Josiah though once notices a tomb that's untouched, and this is why what another thing that kind of tips you off that it's. It's uh, how thorough he was. One tomb, did he say, well, it's just one. No, he said, what's that tomb doing untouched? What, anybody remember who, which tomb that was? <laughs> yes. It was the tomb of that prophet that prophesied to Jeroboam. Yeah. That's right. Remember the old the old prophet and the new prophet, the old, the old prophet and the young prophet. And the young prophet went and was supposed to deliver a message. He was not supposed to go to anybody's house. Uh, the king, I believe he was the king, he, he told this. And he told him because he said, why don't you come eat with me? And he said, if you were to give me half my king, half your kingdom, I still can't go with you. God said not to. So on the way back, then the old, the old prophet Basically tells him, God told me to ask you and you come, told me to tell you to come to my house. And so he does and he goes back and then a lion kills him. And, uh, so the, the thing that I didn't, I noticed here, I, I kept looking to see if maybe I missed something was, you remember what the old prophet said to do when he died? He said, bury me with who? 
the young prophet. So it only looks like the young prophet is in there. So he may still be alive. No, he can't. I don't think he could be. But anyway, uh, I just had to go back and look at all that. But anyway, but it was it was that. And he said, "Don't touch that." He's a righteous man. Don't touch that. There's no reason we need to do anything uh, about that. Okay, Josiah burns everything and everyone associated with idols. You can just see the thoroughness that jo Josiah is not going to leave one stone unturned to do what God wants. He removes the bones of the idolatrous priests from the tombs and the graves. Rather than leaving them in the ground, he goes and has them all pulled out, every one of them. And he puts their bones on, in the fire and he burns all their bones with fire. So there's nothing left of them. You cannot go, you could not go by to anybody's grave and say, that was so and so. He was my grandfather or whatever. And he's not there because he offered sacrifices well, to idols. It's my understanding too that so doing that, that place was the Bible. Okay. So we come back and okay. Reestablish idol worship at that site again. Oh, okay. I didn't, I didn't realize that. Um, it is, it is our removal of sin too. You just see that removal. You know, I'm trying to remove every bit of sin out of your minds to see that nothing good comes from sin. So that's a good point. It's an interesting point. Okay. They burned the bones on the altars too. And it was the altars that, from what I understand, the altars that they, the, the priests either had built or helped build. Um, so they they put their bones on the on altars, and once the altars are, they burn up all the bones, and they burn up, they grind up all the burn up and grind up all the altars. So I would think there would be some of the things made up of metals, such as you know bronze and things like that, because I don't know if you could have a wooden altar without burning it up. So um, they just got rid of everything, because as he said, all that is defiled, and God didn't want it, and that's why it was all taken out of the house of God too. Josiah executes all the practicing idolatrous priests. He doesn't give them an opportunity to repent. He just goes and has every one of them killed. Was that wrong or was that commanded to do? What was people who followed the idols, they were supposed to be, if they didn't repent, they were supposed to be uh, annihilated, were they not? That's why they, that's, that was the whole point of going into Canaan. Uh, they were not, they were supposed to take out all the, the, uh, all the pagans there. Uh, again, thoroughness. You know, he's supposed to get this stuff out of Judah, yet he keeps going farther north, 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 all the way up to Ephraim and wipes out all these so you can't cross the line over here and go up and offer a sacrifice to a God. You, you, you got to go a long, long way. And it's kind of like, okay, I'm afraid I'm going to spill this and it's worth a lot of money, so I'm going to go over there and sit it on the podium over there and stand over here, and that way I won't knock it over. And he did that so they wouldn't get back into idolatry. He kept them separated for that. He had every image and every utensil reduced to powder. So you see just the, the things, and, and I really just skimmed over what it said he did for all that. He was thorough and, and all of that. He, he, and he just kept it up, you know, till he got it all done. At 18, he repairs and restores the house of the Lord. It's been in uh, bad shape. Uh, it's not been taken care of. Uh, they've been putting things or idols in there, so they have to clean it out. They have to repair it. So there was money collected by the Levites, and, uh, and it was given to skill for craftsmen. And the craftsmen were very honest. And they said, you don't even have to keep an account of, of uh, what they've spent because we believe them to be honest people and you don't have to worry about that. Hilkiah, who is a high priest, he finds the money when bringing, I, I put that wrong, he finds, what's that word supposed to be? He finds what when bringing out the money out of the house of the Lord? Book of the law, Okay. And this is the high priest, and he doesn't know it's in there. In that, you know, doesn't that tell you how far away they had to have gotten from that? He don't know it's in there, and he finds it. He gives it to Shaphan and says, "Here, you take this down to the king, and you re you you give it to him." So he gives it to him. Hilkiah gives the book to Shaphan to read to the king. Josiah's reaction to reading the law. This is a surprise to him. 
This is the Pentateuch. This is the first five books of the Bible. And he's not read it before. And he doesn't know what it says. And when he reads it, he's shocked. What does he do when, it, when it's read to him? I think Shafan, Shafan read this to him. What does he do when it's read to, read to him? Tore his clothes. Tore his clothes. It carried a lot of weight with God, didn't it? To tear your clothes? I mean, God recognizes that in the end of this chapter, that because you tore your clothes and you humbled yourself and you did a lot of other things, but he brings that out, because you tore your clothes. Everybody knows it whenever they, you know, a king tore his clothes. What did Josiah tell several men to go do? What did, Jer what did Josiah tell several of the men to go do? Oh, yeah. When he reads it, he, he realizes, oh, we have not done a lot of this stuff. We have broken a lot of God's laws. What am I going to do? So what does he tell several of the men to go do? Go inquire of the Lord. And they go to a, a woman prophet. Um, her name is Huldah. She's a prophetess. And um, what was her answer to the king concerning Judah? And what she said, remember what message she sent back to King Josiah? He's going to bring disaster on this place, but he's not going to do it when? In Josiah's time. And that, that floors me a lot of times because I think, okay, the law was broken until Josiah read it and realized what they needed to do, and he went through all of this to make it right. And God's still going still to wipe it out. But I guess it's because it's been profaned. I guess it's because and anytime something was profaned before God, he detested it. And he probably knew that they were just going to go back into wickedness again. So Josiah restores the, the worship, uh, the worship that God expected. They went back and did everything like God expected to do. Josiah reads the law to all the people. He makes a covenant with God to keep his commandments. He, he makes this covenant with those people and makes them basically swear an oath that they're going to keep these commandments. Uh, he has all in Jerusalem and Judah do the same. So the Passover is then observed. This is going to be an incredible Passover. The priest's duties are set. The Ark of the Covenant is placed in the temple. And he said, you're not going to need those poles anywhere anymore. It's not going to go anywhere. It's staying there. So that was the last time that they were supposed to have to carry it. Josiah made sure that everybody had an offering. So he gave away 30,000 lambs and 3,000 cattle, if I'm reading that correctly. He gave it to them. You know, I always thought, well, if, you, you know, if, if somebody gives it to you, it's not an offering, but I guess they could give it to you and you could decide whether you wanted to do it or not. But uh, he, did, he did give them that. So there was no Passover of the magnitude uh, that had been kept since the days of Samuel. So it was really an incredible uh, Passover that they had. They, they really did it up the way God wanted to. So we'll talk a little bit about Josiah's death. This is something else I wish more was said about it. Pharaoh Necho, he heads up to Syria. That's the red line. Um, you see the red line going up. And so when they get to, I wish I could zoom in on it some, but when they get to this point right here, they're going right by Josiah. Now, it doesn't say whether Josiah had no idea they were coming. He sees it. He goes arms and goes out to battle to, you know, to fight with them. But Pharaoh Necho sends him a message and says, I don't have any problem with you. Just, just leave me alone. I'm going up here. But the one thing that he said I can't confirm, it doesn't confirm in the Bible. He says, God told me to go up there. God tells me to go up here to uh, Car Carchemish up here, right there. He told me to go up there and, and fight these people. But if you can see the, the note there, it basically says that the Medes and the Babylonians were already en route to go fight them. They're just, they're just right here. They start like right in here. So they get over there and wipe them out or, ca or capture or whatever and defeat them before um, before he can, Pharaoh Nico can even get up there. So, but Josiah goes out there and he's, he's beat. He's shot with an arrow 
he goes out in disguise because he doesn't want to be seen. And I don't know if this is just because, you know, if he inquired of God, he just felt like, you know, king's got to do something. You know, when they're, when they're coming this way, you got to do something. You can't sit back and let your whole place be annihilated in case it's a trick. So he goes and tries to do that, and it ends up being his death, and he's carried off and, and buried. So thank you for your comments. I appreciate it. And um, we will have the next lesson Sunday. Uh, I don't know what that is, but it'll be on your schedule.